Good morning and thanks so much for tuning in to my presentation on a recovery curriculum supporting pupils in dealing with loss. My name's Kate Hamblin and I work at Fursdown School but before I say any more about myself I just wanted to share with you a few words that really resonated with me which were emailed to all Fursdown staff from our deputy head Sarah Watson um, quite near the beginning of lockdown. You might have heard these words already. I heard that we are all in the same boat, but it's not like that. We're sailing in the same storm, but not in the same boat. Your ship could be shipwrecked and mine might not be or vice versa. For some, quarantine is optimal, a moment of reflection, of reconnection, easy in flip-flops with a cocktail or coffee. For others, this is a desperate financial and family crisis. For some that live alone, they're facing endless loneliness, while for others, it is, pe it is peace, rest, and time with their mother, father, sons, and daughters. Some are bringing in extra money with endless overtime. Others are working for more hours for less money due to pay cuts or loss in sales. Others no longer have a job. Some want to go back to work because they don't qualify for unemployment and are running out of money. Others want to kill those who break the quarantine and are seen outside. Some are home spending two to three hours a day helping their child with online schooling, while others are spending two to three hours a day to educate their children on top of a 10 to 12 hour workday. Some have experienced the near death of the virus. Some have already lost someone from it and some are not sure if their loved ones are going to make it. Others don't believe this is a big deal. So friends, we're not in the same boat. We're going through a time when our perceptions and needs are completely different. Each of us will emerge in our own way from this storm. It's very important to see beyond what is seen at first glance, not just looking, actually seeing. We are all on different ships during this storm, experiencing a very different journey. So don't judge it, don't judge others by what's happening in your boat. We are all just fighting our way through the storm. Never has this never have these words rang more true when thinking about pupils' experiences of lockdown during this challenging time. Some may have had a great time enjoying extra time with their family and a slower way of life, while others may have found it extremely difficult that loss of routine, not seeing friends, missed exams, all those things that they've lost. With that said, here's a little bit about me. So I'm a mum of three children, age 12, eight, and one and a half years. I'm a teacher at Fursdown School and I've been there for over 15 years. I studied art at university and I have an interest in how art can be used in a therapeutic way. And I've practiced mindfulness for the last six years and I'm now trained to deliver the Pause B curriculum created by the Mindfulness in Schools project. My experience of lockdown has been varied. I've really enjoyed the slower pace of life at times, but at times I've really struggled with the home educating and juggling teaching and just generally keeping on top of things. So for, for our pupils, it's going to be as varied their, their experiences of lockdown and you know we're just not really going to know quite how they've experienced lockdown until they come back to school and start sharing with us what's happened. So what is a recovery curriculum? At first down we have a team of teachers from across the school that make up the SWIRL team. This stands for supporting well-being and emotional resilience in learning. This team make time to regularly get together to look at ways to support and improve the well-being of both pupils and staff. 
We've met regularly online since lockdown began to discuss and explore how we can continue to support well-being during this challenging and unusual time. In their think piece on the recovery curriculum, the carpenters talk about how it would be naive of any head teacher to think that the child will pick up the curriculum at exactly the same point at which they left it on the day their school closed. Too much has happened. The piece explores the idea that the common thread that runs through the current lived experiences of our children is loss. Loss of routine and structure, friendship and interaction, opportunity and freedom. It's really worth a read. It then goes on to suggest ways to recover, in particular by building a new curriculum to support and facilitate this. It suggests building the curriculum on five levers, relationships, community, transparent curriculum, metacognition, and space to be, to discover self and to find their voice on learning in this issue. Another invaluable resource the Swell team were introduced to was the short online course by Pookie Knightsmith. Be the adult a child needs during lockdown. Pookie gives excellent suggestions on supporting children inside and outside of school under these four crucial areas. Number one, flow and creativity. Being able to get lost in an activity so that they forget worries and anxieties can be a real gift at the moment. More about this in a couple of slides time. Number two, comfort. More than anything right now, children need to be comforted by creating environments that are predictable, consistent and safe. Three, accomplishment. Finding ways to help children to feel like they are achieving and providing opportunities for them to meet even small goals can be great for self-esteem and well-being. And finally, number four, probably the most important one, fun. Consider the things that will usually spark joy for you and your learners and lean towards these in your curriculum. This free course is well worth a look with lots of wonderful ideas. So what will we include in our recovery curriculum at First Down? Well, First Down School is an all age school with two different pathways when it comes to the curriculum. And it's clear that the recovery cu curriculum will need to cater for a wide variety of experiences, needs, and take into consideration the maturity of the pupil. After several meetings, the SWIRL team have now begun to work in key stage groups to look at the needs of the pupils and start to develop a recovery curriculum that will be delivered inside school and to pupils outside of school, depending on what school looks like in September. Over the next few slides, I'll take a brief look at some of the interventions and strategies we aim to base our curriculum on. Flow and creativity. As Pookie states in her training, being able to get lost in an activity so that they can forget all about their worries and issues can be a real gift for children right now. Activities that really engage them and enable them to find their flow or which allow them to be creative can be particularly helpful. Similarly, getting lost in someone else's world by reading, watching or participating in games can provide important respite. Here are some of the ways on the slide we hope to achieve this. Learning to find flow states during creative activities using the pupil's interest to encourage research and development of ideas in flow projects. This can be particularly useful for pupils of ASD. Allow pupils the time to continue when they are engaged and immersed in an activity. There's no need to stop the flow and start a new activity. Make timetable adjustments and be flexible. Try to provide the time and space for children to continue, enjoy and really thrive in that activity. Time to talk, share and get identification. 
Never has it been more important to give people that time to reflect on what they've been through and share these experiences with their peers and with staff. Some pupils may have lost loved ones and be grieving, where others may not have wanted to return to school as they've enjoyed being at home with family. Remember, we were all weathering the same storm, but in different boats, providing regular opportunity for pupils to talk in a safe and calm environment is crucial. Some pupils will find this hard and it may need, it may need to be facilitated by circle time games and some may not even see the point in looking back, but prefer to focus on now. Others may find it tricky and need to be engaged in activities to take the pressure off of them. This we hope will then lend itself to parallel listening and a more natural flow of conversation. Games and simple creative tasks can be, a, can be really great for this. So building Lego, coloring, painting, making models, making things out of plasticine, cooking together. Getting outside and going for a walk can be great for this too. And just to draw your attention to the last point on the slide, it's okay to not want to talk too. There shouldn't be any pressure on pupils if they don't see the point or they don't want to. Practicing gratitude. It may seem hard to feel grateful lately. The world feels like it's been turned upside down overnight and I can fluctuate between feeling scared and anxious to at times enjoying a slower pace of life listening to the birds and drinking my morning coffee in the sunshine. I've been more judgmental than usual, more on edge and more impatient at times with trying to juggle work and home learning. Coronavirus seems to be bringing out the best and the worst of humanity. In positive psychology research, gratitude is strongly and consistently associated with greater happiness. Gratitude helps people feel more positive emotions, relish good experiences, improve their health, deal with adversity and build strong relationships. For me, it helps me to lean towards a glass half full kind of attitude. Developing a gratitude practice can happen in many different shapes and forms. The key is to keep it simple, be genuine and not minimize your own suffering. It's okay not to feel grateful for having a roof over your head every day. Model a grateful outlook to your pupils on a daily basis, the small stuff and the big stuff. On the slide, there are some examples of things you could try with your pupils. Practice mindfulness. There have been many misconceptions as to what mindfulness actually is. It's not delving into someone's past or digging up past experiences or clearing the mind of any thoughts. Mindfulness can be used to support emotional well-being and is all about learning to direct our attention to our experiences, our experience as it unfolds moment by moment with open minded curiosity and acceptance. Rather than worrying about what has happened or might happen, as many of us spend a lot of time doing, me included, it trains us to respond skillfully to whatever is happening right now by focusing our attention on the breath and the senses. Research has shown that regular formal mindfulness practice develops the prefrontal cortex of the brain and positively impacts functions such as regulating emotions, decision-making and empathy. Many of us have been stuck in our heads during lockdown, worrying, stressing and overthinking. Mindfulness can provide a break from that and allows us to be just present. I feel really passionately about mindfulness and it's something I practice in my home life, but also at school. So I thought we could have a go at just doing a short mindfulness practice together and it could be one that perhaps you could try with your pupils when they come back to school. It's called petal breathing. I'm just going to show you a short clip to begin with of some blooming flowers and then we'll begin the practice.
Okay, so I think you get the idea of the flowers opening into bloom. And we're going to use this image to help us with a petal breathing practice. So it can be really helpful to show a video like that. They can just be found on YouTube before doing a practice like this with pupils. So this practice will take about two minutes. So first, find a way to sit so that you're comfortable and you can feel your feet on the floor and that you're sitting and noticing any sensations that might be in your feet as they make that contact with the floor. The weight of your body and your feet, especially touching the ground, your body where it makes contact with the chair. Notice the shape of your body as you sit with your back tall, sitting with a sense of purpose for this mindfulness practice. Now bring your focus to your breathing, noticing where you feel it most and whether your breathing is fast or slow, deep or shallow. There's no need to change anything. You're just tuning in, tuning into the breath, this breath right now, anchoring us to the present moment. And the breath can tell us so much about how we're feeling at any given moment. Once you've explored your breath for a few moments, using one hand, gently bring your fingertips and thumb together, like closed petals on one of those flowers that we saw in the video. Reconnecting with the flow of your breath. As you feel an out-breath beginning, begin to slowly open your fingers wide as the breath moves out. And as the breath moves in, gently bring your fingers and thumb together again. Repeat this with the rhythm of your breathing. Really opening, extending and releasing the hand out and then bringing your fingers and thumb and closing your hand again until those, the fingertips and thumb meet. And we're not trying to change our breath in any way. Our fingers should be following the rhythm of our breath to the full extent of the out breath and the full extent of the in breath. And if you'd like to close your eyes when you tune into the rhythm of your breath, along with the opening and closing of your hand. See if you can explore how this feels with a friendly curiosity. And if your mind wanders, that's okay, that's what minds do. We're just gonna gently bring it back to focusing on our breath and following that with the opening and closing of your hand. Just repeat this for three more full inhales and exhales. And then when you're finished, gently open your eyes. The last few slides in my presentation will just have a quick look at 
what each area of the school, different key stages, are developing as part of their recovery curriculum. So there's quite a lot of information on each slide. I'm just going to um, pull out some key parts and then hopefully you can go back and read the slide should you want to, to get the full information. So the primary team have recognised the need for flexibility and to allow time for flow activities to continue when pupils are immersed and engaged. There'll be lots of careful observation of the pupils and there will be discrete sessions focusing on emotions and sharing experiences during lockdown. Pupils will be given lots of opportunity to talk about these experiences with their peers and staff in, so in small groups and one-to-one. -one. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, at First Down we have two different pathways in the curriculum. So on our foundation level curriculum, there are many similarities to how primary will be looking to develop their recovery curriculum. But the foundation team also recognise the need for a clear cyclical sequence to run, providing pupils with movement and sensory breaks after short activities. And these short activities will focus on creativity and flow, collaboration to help build that sense of togetherness again, and make sure that they're also maximising the outside environment as a learning space. This next slide is quite a nice diagram for how that cyclical sequence might work. I'll just leave that for a couple of seconds. In upper school, there'll be much less movement between classes and staff as there traditionally is, with the form groups spending a lot more time with their tutors. They will adopt a topic approach, something that we normally see uh, in the foundation curriculum in primary, um, and they'll adopt this to learning and work towards a shared outcome. The content of the topic, um, just being a platform really, of which to rebuild relationships, reflect and share. Flow projects will also be encouraged to foster a sense of achievement and accomplishment. There'll be many opportunities throughout the school day to have drop-in and one-to-one -one and group sessions where pupils will be able to explore what lies ahead for these pupils, discussing their ambitions and identifying how school can support them with achieving this in their future. The recovery curriculum at First Down is a work in progress. And so for my last slide, the word I really want you to remember is this idea of flexibility. Um, all the planning in the world will not prepare educators for some of the situations we find ourselves in when supporting pupils back in school after lockdown. We won't be able to predict them and they'll throw, they'll throw us off guard at times. So flexibility needs to be that word we keep in the forefront of our minds. Flexibility of timetable, of activities, with engagement. But we will continue to work spontaneously and intuitively as educators, as teachers do, as best we can to meet the needs of all our pupils, whatever their experience may bring to the surface. Flexibility needs to be the word we keep in the forefront of our minds. In the words of Barry and Matthew Carpenter, no government can give you the guideline for that. It's down to you as that skilled, intuitive teacher who can lift the mask of fear and disenfranchisement from your child. You can engage that child as a learner once more, for engagement is the liberation of intrinsic motivation. 
Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to my presentation on a recovery curriculum. Just this last slide here, I've put some links to some of the resources the SWIRL team at Fursdown School have found really useful. So um, I hope it's been helpful and I wish you all luck in your return to school in ever, whatever shape or form it may be. Thanks ever so much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye.